Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe. Chapter forty four The Liberator. George Shelby had written to his mother merely a line, stating the day that she might expect him home. Of the death scene of his old friend he had not the heart to write. He had tried several times, and only succeeded in half choking himself, and invariably finished by tearing up the paper, wiping his eyes, and rushing somewhere to get quiet. There was a pleased bustle all through the Shelby mansion that day, in expectation of the rival of young Massa George. Mrs. Shelby was seated in her comfortable parlor, where a cheerful hickory fire was dispelling the chill of the late autumn evening. A supper-table, glittering with plate and cut glass, was set out, on whose arrangements our former friend, old Chloe, was presiding. Arrayed in a new calico dress, with clean white apron and high, well-starched turban, her black polished face glowing with satisfaction, she lingered, with needless punctiliousness, around the arrangements of the table, merely as an excuse for talking a little to her mistress. "'Laws, now, won't it look natural to him?' she said. "'Thar, I set his plate just where he likes it round by the fire. Massa George allers wants to warm seat. Oh, go away! Why didn't Sally get out the best teapot? The little new one Massa George got for Mrs. Christmas. I'll have it out. And Mrs. has heard from Massa George?' she said, inquiringly. "'Yes, Chloe, but only a line just to say he would be home to-night, if he could. That's all.' "'Didn't say nothing about my old man, s'pose?' said Chloe, still fidgeting with the teacups. "'No, he didn't. He did not speak of anything, Chloe. He said he would tell all when he got home.' "'Just like Massa George. He's allers so fierce for telling everything hisself. I allers minded that I in Massa George. Don't see for my part how white people generally can bear to have to write things much as they do, writing such slow, uneasy kind of work.' Mrs. Shelby smiled. I'm thinking my old man won't know the boys and the baby. Lor, she's the biggest gal now. Look, she is, too, and pert, Polly is. She's out to the house now, watching the hoe cake. I's got just the berry pattern my old man liked so much a bacon. Just such as I gin him the morning he was took off. Lord bless us, how I felt that our morning. Mrs. Shelby sighed and felt a heavy weight on her heart at this allusion. She had felt uneasy ever since she received her son's letter, lest something should prove to be hidden behind the veil of silence which he had drawn. "'Missus has got them bills?' said Chloe anxiously. "'Yes, Chloe.' "'Cause I wants to show my old man them very bills the perfectioner gave me. And,' says he, "'Chloe, I wish you'd stay longer. Thank you, Massa,' I says I. "'I would, only my old man's coming home, and Missus, she can't do without me no longer.' There's just what I telled him. Very nice man, that Massa Jones was." Chloe had pertinaciously insisted that the very bills in which her wages had been paid should be preserved to show her husband in memorial of her capability, and Mrs. Shelby had readily consented to humor her in the request. "'He won't know Polly. My old man won't. Laws, it's been five years since they tuck him. She was baby then. Couldn't but just stand up. Remember how tickled he used to be, cause she would keep a fallin' over when she sought out to walk? Laws o' me!" The rattling of wheels now was heard. "'Massa George!' said Aunt Chloe, starting to the window. Mrs. Shelby ran to the entry door, and was folded in the arms of her son. Aunt Chloe stood anxiously straining her eyes out into the darkness. "'Oh, poor Aunt Chloe!' said George, stopping compassionately, and taking her hard black hand between both his. I'd have given all my fortune to have brought him with me, but he's gone to a better country." There was a passionate exclamation from Mrs. Shelby, but Aunt Chloe said nothing. The party entered the supper-room. The money of which Chloe was so proud was still lying on the table. "'There,' said she, gathering it up and holding it with a trembling hand to her mistress. Don't never want to see nor hear on't again, just as I knew it would be sold and murdered on them our old plantations. Chloe turned and was walking proudly out of the room. Mrs. Shelby followed her softly and took one of her hands, drew her down into a chair, and sat down by her. My poor good Chloe, said she. 
Chloe leaned her head on her mistress's shoulder and sobbed out, "'Oh, miss, excuse me, my heart's broke, that's all.' "'I know it is,' said Mrs. Shelby, as her tears fell fast, "'and I cannot heal it. But Jesus can. He healeth the broken-hearted, and bindeth up their wounds.' There was a silence for some time, and all wept together. At last George, sitting down beside the mourner, took her hand, and with simple pathos repeated the triumphant scene of her husband's death and his last messages of love. About a month after this, one morning, all the servants of the Shelby estate were convened together in the great hall that ran through the house to hear a few words from their young master. To the surprise of all, he appeared among them with a bundle of papers in his hand, containing a certificate of freedom to every one on the place, which he read successively and presented, amid the sobs and tears and shouts of all present. Many, however, pressed around him, earnestly begging him not to send them away, and with anxious faces tendering back their free papers. "'We don't want to be no freer than we are. We's always had all we wanted. We don't want to leave the old place and master and missus and rest.' "'My good friends,' said George, as soon as he could get a silence, "'there will be no need for you to leave me. The place wants as many hands to work it as it did before. We need the same about the house that we did before. But you are now free men and free women. I shall pay you wages for your work, such as we shall agree on. The advantage is that in case of my getting in debt or dying, things that might happen, you cannot now be taken up and sold. I expect to carry on the estate, and to teach you what, perhaps, it will take you some time to learn, how to use the rights I give you as free men and women. I expect you to be good and willing to learn, and I trust in God that I shall be faithful and willing to teach. And now, my friends, look up and thank God for the blessing of freedom." An aged patriarchal negro, who had grown gray and blind on the estate, now rose, and lifting his trembling hand, said, "'Let us give thanks unto the Lord!' As all kneeled by one consent, a more touching and hearty Te Deum never ascended to heaven, though borne on the peal of organ, bell, and cannon, than came from that honest old heart. On rising, another struck up a Methodist hymn, of which the burden was, the year of jubilee is come. Return, ye ransomed sinners, home. One thing more, said George, as he stopped the congratulations of the throng. You all remember our good old Uncle Tom? George here gave a short narration of the scene of his death, and of his loving farewell to all on the place, and added, It was on his grave, my friends, that I resolved before God that I would never own another slave, while it was possible to free him, that nobody, through me, should ever run the risk of being parted from home and friends, and dying on a lonely plantation, as he died. So when you rejoice in your freedom, think that you owe it to that good old soul, and pay it back in kindness to his wife and children. Think of your freedom every time you see Uncle Tom's cabin, and let it be a memorial to put you all in mind to follow in his steps and be honest, and faithful, and Christian, as he was. End of chapter 44